Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. My name is Muhammad Muhammad. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. And as always, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here online. Uh, before we get started, uh, I wanted to just say a few words. Uh, obviously, as you all know, uh, Palestine is under attack right now. And our hearts, of course, go out to all Palestinians suffering, whether it's in Gaza or Jerusalem, the West Bank, in 48 Palestine, or in the refugee camps and on the borders in Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. Uh, in response to these terrible Israeli attacks, we've started an emergency campaign uh, for Gaza and Jerusalem to fundraise for humanitarian relief efforts. If you are able to, please donate whatever you can because Palestinians are definitely going to need our help right now. Uh, as always, 100% of all donations will be used only for relief, none for operating or admin expenses. You can donate online at www.thejerusalemfund.org slash Reza Jerusalem, one word. Uh, or you can visit our website at thejerusalemfund.org where you'll find the donation page and buttons uh, to take you to the donation page. Uh, you can also donate through Facebook uh, on our Facebook page. Uh, please also let your family and friends know uh, because every dollar helps. And if you're unable to donate, uh, you can also help us by following us on Twitter. Our account is at Palestine Center uh, on Facebook, which is uh, facebook.com slash Jerusalem Fund. And on Instagram, where our account is, uh, our account is also Jerusalem Fund. Uh, and please let your family and friends uh, know about our social media accounts as well. Uh, and that's where we share all of our updates, um, news from Palestine and upcoming events. Uh, so any help that you can provide is much appreciated. Thank you very much. Today, we're happy to host uh, Dr. Shafi Ghabra for a talk titled The Palestine Nakba from Ethnic Cleansing in 1948 to Apartheid in 2021, where he will discuss the history of the Nakba and what it means to Palestinians. He will also answer some major questions on the establishment of Israel, the forced ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian population, stories about the land and refugees. He will conclude with an analysis of the present situation in Palestine as a case of ongoing and deepening ethnic cleansing and apartheid. We are also very happy to host Saeed Arakat here uh, who will be moderating this event. So a little bit about Dr. Shafiq Ghabra. He has been a professor of political science at Kuwait University since 1987, and he was a founding president of the American University of Kuwait from 2003 to 2006. He also directed the Kuwait Information Office in Washington, D.C. from 1998 to 2002, as well as the Center of Strategic Studies at Kuwait University from 2002 to 2003. Uh, Dr. Rabra earned his BA from Georgetown University in 1975, his MA from Purdue University in 1983, and his PhD in political science from the University of Texas at Austin in 1987. He is the author of eight books and numerous studies, including Palestinians in Kuwait, The Family and the Politics of Survival, and The Nakba and the Emergence of the Palestinian Diaspora in Kuwait. Dr. Ghabra has also been a regular columnist and guest of various international and Arab media outlets since 1988. Saeed Arakat is a member of the Palestine Center Committee here, and he is the Washington Bureau Chief for the Palestinian newspaper Al Quds, a daily for which he is a writer, columnist, and analyst. He previously served as spokesman and director of public information for the United Nations Assistance Mission for Iraq. And he currently teaches as an adjunct professor at American University in Washington, DC. At the end of uh, the discussion, we will have a Q&A session. So, for everybody watching, you can ask your questions on the YouTube chat feature, which is on the side, uh, or you can tweet your questions to at Palestine Center. Uh, for any of you watching on Facebook, uh, you can also post your messages and uh, questions there. Uh, so I will now pass it on to uh, Saeed, and thank you both for joining us today. We, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Muhammad, and uh, I'm truly honored, Dr. Shafi, uh, to be with you, to, to, to have this conversation with you. Uh, Dr. Shafi is, of course, a, a tremendous intellectual asset for the Palestinians as they go 
uh, through their struggle for liberation, especially at these trying times. Uh, certainly, if anyone uh, knows uh, the history of the Palestinian and the Nakba in particular, it is Dr. Shafiq uh, Al Ghabra. So, w- without uh, further ado, uh, Dr. Shafiq, um, a few days ago, less than four days ago, or four days ago exactly, a uh, Palestinian commemorated uh, this very traumatic uh, event. You know, the 73rd anniversary of this traumatic event, more than 700,000 people, maybe close to 800,000 people, were, you know, basically driven from their homes by force. Hundreds of villages and towns and so on uh, were destroyed. Uh, many uh, of uh, these Palestinian refugees, Palestinian refugees ended up in Gaza. And in fact, and uh, now, you know, they bear the brunt of this horrific uh, uh, Israeli uh, aggression. So that, that is ongoing now. Uh, and so in, how do you see the significance of this 73rd anniversary of the Nakba? Through so this, you know, moment in time, as we see uh, Palestinians uh, suffer, uh, get destroyed, get killed, men, women, children, and so on, but also stand heroically in the face of this horrible aggression. Uh, so as we, we agreed to make it a, a, a dialogue, a question right. and answer and a dialogue. So right. in, in really dealing with this question, how do I see the Nakba today? Mm. Uh, it's a continuity of the Nakba that right. happened then. Uh, nothing has stopped. And uh, the Nakba uh, goes through the decades. Uh, um, it's the same story, uh, a group of people. And then when Israel was established, the Israeli state, the Zionist state had a mission. And the mission is to clear the land from the original inhabitants. And that's the ethnic cleansing part. And the other mission is to claim the land, to steal, to take, to put its hands on. Uh, And as this happens, Palestinians will definitely uh, resist it. And the story of the Palestinians uh, since the Nakba, but also during the Nakba, and since the British mandate in 1920, and during the British mandate in 1920, all the way till 1948, and even the story of the Palestinians during the last 20 or 30 years of the Ottoman Empire is a story of resisting resisting uh, uh, that particular myth that there is a, a land that is empty for a, a group of people uh, who uh, don't have a state. And, and, uh, and the reality, Palestine was full of Palestinians. They had hundreds, hundreds of towns and villages had many cities, had an urban elite, had a, a prosperous agriculture, had a prosperous life, and uh, were central. I mean, even during Ottoman times, uh, Jerusalem and its vicinity, Mutasarfiya uh, al-Quds, Jerusalem was central in the in the Ottoman Empire, uh, and, and so all of that uh, uh, tells us that we are experiencing a process of a continuity of the Nakba. Mm. And because of that, the Nakba today lives exactly as it happened in 1948 and before, meaning that nothing has been resolved. Neither the Palestinians were allowed to return, neither their properties were given back to them, nor their, uh, 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 the Israelis followed them into the West Bank, into East Jerusalem, followed them into Gaza, followed the refugees everywhere uh, 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 with brutal power. And so the Nakba, uh, was not resolved ever, and no solution was found, and therefore it is a present mm-hmm. and a future reality, given that the, the Palestinians uh, experience it and cannot, cannot accept what is thrown on them. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, as, as you said, it's what the, the, the whole thing was begun uh, with the notion that Palestine was a land without people, and the Jews were a people without land, which is, of course, you know, a big myth. But that, I guess, the best way to erase a people is say they do not exist. And that was the premise. The premise of, of that notion was that the Palestinians don't exist. And of course, as you mentioned, historically, they have existed. 
that go back, you know, hundreds, thousands of years, probably, uh, you know, very, in many ways, they sort of, uh, they are the history of the, of the geography itself, the history of the country itself can be traced, uh, uh, you know, probably thousands of years back. I'm no historian. I don't know that. Uh, but when we look at what is happening today, you know, for these people, I mean, you know, for, for the Palestinians uh, who are in Jabalia, you know, for Shujaia and many of these refugee camps that are probably one of the most densely populated uh, areas on, on earth. I mean, you know, some, somebody was saying that Gaza was second to Calcutta in terms of, of population density. So uh, how do they deal uh, with this very traumatic <laughs> event that, you know, I mean, we have, it doesn't stop, it is episodic, you know, but it does not stop. How do they deal with it? How do the Palestinians deal with it actually to go on to the next day and to the next uh, part of the next station along the way to liberation? See, my understanding of this is that the Nakba itself <laughs> was so unjust, so, so uh, difficult, so uh, painful at every level. Even if I tell you stories of my family from both my father and my mother, it's yeah. amazing the, the injustice, the difficulty, the complexity of, I mean, it's not like only losing your land, your, your, okay. your house, but losing your entire place. Not yeah. only losing a, 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 a property, you could lose it in, in a market, but mm. it's losing the entire collective, the collective being of, of mm. who you are. Your entire community, like city like Haifa, only 3,000 Arabs stayed and they kicked them all out of their houses and put them in, uh, in a certain uh, poor area, uh, settled them there. And then suddenly, I mean, they came and took over the houses, the property, the places, the shops, the markets, the businesses. They just took it, simply took over. No remorse, nothing. So it was so unjust that, that you leave penniless. You leave totally destroyed. And then they start to erase your memory, to erase your history, to erase every, and look into excavation to prove that you didn't even exist. Though it is true, you belong to a civilization that has roots that goes back to the Canaanites and, mm -hmm. and, and goes back to the old Palestinians who existed. I mean, it's, it's a whole story of how Palestinians were formed as a nation, as a people within the Arab context, definitely, and within the Islamic context. So the, the, the difficulty, the complexity, the level of the injustice created out of the Palestinians a tough people. Right. A people who are uh, tough, mm -hmm. who could take some of the worst uh, uh, experiences and try to turn them into something positive, try to resist. This is how they, they were totally broken in 1948, and yet they were able to flourish through education, through know-how, through their abilities and, and, and they became very tough. And therefore it is, it is not surprising to me no. to have seen this in Lebanon during the times when Israel was erasing refugee camps. I mean, right. place like Rashidiyah was erased in South Lebanon next to Tyre, was erased several times and the Palestinians rebuilt it. A place like Sabra and Shatila, I mean, the, the, despite the massacre, I mean, people have that will because it's the level of the injustice made them strong and, and yet they are human, they suffer, they cry, they feel the pain, they, 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 they know exactly where they are, but they realize that their back is to the wall. There is, their back is to the sea. Where do you go from there? Where do you go? You go to go where? To places that may end up even massacring you as well? Places where you become a refugee into a refugee into a refugee, where do you go? There, this is the stand and therefore, when you look at the symbol of even Palestinian resistance in the 1970s into 82, why did the Palestinians in the Beaufort ca Castle, that is Salah uh, Castle in South Lebanon, 40 of them stand, fight and die, knowing that the Israeli army is a hundred times stronger and will be able to kill all of them. Yet they fight and they create casualties on the other, they keep the flame and therefore that's not gonna go. They, they, they are able to, to, to resist. And then you compare with other peoples, the Vietnamese in the worst times, yeah. I mean, Vietnam was destroyed many times and yet, you know, the Yemenis under yeah. the situation that we are seeing today, right. 
some yeah. people yeah they they you know so so it's not unusual for right. when there is big injustice there is a, a true resistance and right. people will face up to it yeah yeah, for, for, for sure. I mean, you know, you mentioned something very profound about, you know, people who have who are being made refugees for the third and fourth and fifth time. Okay. I heard that, you know, some people from Jabalia or I mean, thousands, tens of thousands that have been driven in the last uh, few days into just another location and so on. So it is ongoing. And as, as you mentioned, I mean, if we go back to the history of the last 50 years and so on, Israel has pursued the Palestinians killing their intellectuals, assassinating their leaders, uh, going after them in places as far as Tunis, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, other places, of course, Lebanon uh, time uh, and time uh, and time again. But, you know, it, through it all, the Palestinians have proven to be industrious and able to, to, to emerge. But there has been, you know, one must admit that if you look at, if you view the history of the last let's say 60 years, or let's say since, you know, 65, the emergence of the, the modern Palestinian revolution. There has been a great deal of, uh, of I would say, uh, vacuum in terms of a, a leadership that is able to deliver the Palestinians. So, I mean, despite it all, they, they go on. So why do you think that a, a people that are able to resist and able to do all this, and able to produce, you know, a great deal of talent, uh, are not able to, let's say, produce a kind of leadership that really should be up to bar to the, you know, the size, the sheer, you know, size of this complex issue. Uh, the way I look at it is that we are a product of our generation. Yeah. We are a product of our experiences. Right. And so was the leadership of Hajj Amin al-Husseini right. and, 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 and the group surrounding him in Palestine, that, that the, 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 the leaders who were affluent actually, who represented a certain class structure uh, in Palestine and were able to do good things, but at the same time, they had shortcomings, definitely. Mm -hmm. Particularly when you are dealing with a, a far more advanced enemy who has come from all over the world uh, with uh, a certain intention, with the support of international capital, with the support right. of uh, the Rothschilds of the world, with the support of, it, it wasn't an easy uh, uh, job to, to face all of that. Yet people, yes, gave sacrifice and resisted heavily. Look at 36, 39, the Qassam revolution. Right. That was an amazing one. It was one of the biggest in the, in the Arab world against any colonial power. 5,000 Palestinians died, 15,000 uh, uh, injured, uh, 100 and more uh, executed by the British. Uh, that was phenomenal. So, uh, yes, they produce leaders and they produce some good ones as well. Not always uh, the ones that you see not able. I mean, they're political, they're military leaders as well. They're mm. uh, activists, they're, they're, they're all kinds of leaders that, that are, are produced. So I look at 65 as a new era as well, where there is a new generation that uh, was... Uh, uh, schooled in a certain way, went to certain uh, uh, educated, educated mostly in Egyptian universities, uh, mm. uh, uh, lived for a while. Many of them lived in Kuwait and formed their ideas while in Kuwait, but some in other Gulf countries. And, and so you had a leadership, uh, but I, I always felt that the circumstances surrounding the entire struggle is so complex because you're operating within 22 or so Arab countries. You're mm -hmm. operating in an international environment that is not hospitable. You're, you're dealing with an enemy that is the most deceptive, the most complicated, the most uh, uh, the, the enemy that is willing to go all the way to, to, to protect an ideology that is very colonial, settler, uh, uh, very archaic uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the 20th and 21st century. So I'm not blaming here, but what, what I'm trying to say is that we are a product of our times. And I think that the Palestinians will keep producing. Now, looking at the ground myself, the ground, the real the reality, like, like if you really examine the number of Palestinian leaders that were executed by the Israelis and totally assassinated by the Israelis, right. Right. some of them were phenomenal. Right. Uh, 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 I, I, actually, I can name many who 
maybe you know some, but the majority of Palestinians don't know them. Right. And who, uh, who were selfless, uh, but these were the, the cadre in the middle, these were the operatives, these were, you can do that with the Hamas group, but you can do that with the Fatah group, you can do that with the Popular Front, you can do it across the aisle. Uh, those could have been leaders of the future. Many, many of them, most of them were assassinated. Right. Uh, uh, it, it's a massacre of, uh, like you have a, a, a Zionist uh, uh, entity that plans how to assassinate and, and look what they did with many of the Hamas leadership. Look what right. they did with many of the Fatah leadership, the middle, those who could be the future. But at the end, I see that the Palestinians will produce. Today, I look at, at, at uh, Sheikh Jarrah and I see the Kurd uh, uh, family. Uh, yes. Uh, we, are, we are related to them as a matter of Yes, fact. and, and they, are, they, are, they, are, they are future leaders. Uh, yeah. So you, you see, the, the challenge for Zionism was the following. I mean, settler colonialism has always been able to eradicate to completely the native population. Right. The Zionists, I mean, Herzl didn't care whether to go to Palestine or Uganda or Argentina. Right. It is, you see, Zionism, there is a big chunk of it is a Russian phenomenon. Right. Poor Russian, poor Polish areas. Right. Right. That that had that, and they they had they were religious as well, right. and it's 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 that. Right. So they came as settler colonialism finally to Palestine to discover right. that they cannot rid, get rid of the natives. That right. today the native population is equal to their population. Mm -hmm. There is no way to get rid of it. So so right. this is the, this this frustrates the Zionist movement and keeps producing for us more more extremists, more extremists who want to go further into massacring, into killing, into murdering, into destroying Al-Aqsa because it's a symbol. They want to destroy every city you have. They want to make sure you don't have a center. You don't have a place that, that ignites your identity and your pride. And they want to make you totally, they want to decide who lives and who dies and who exists among you. It is, it is a very unique type of settler colonialism that failed to get rid of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian people over time are learning. I mean, today Hamas is learning much yeah. new lessons compared to what it had in 2014. Yeah. Talking even from a military point of view, as simple as it is, they, yeah. they will get there. So I think we will be producing and uh, have produced in the past. And the, all this Palestinian nationalism and movement was on the shoulders of many Palestinian leaders, some of them known, some of them not known, some of them uh, died in silence and nobody knew besides the people who knew them. And, and that will continue. Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, uh, the, uh, Israel is a, is a ruthless enemy of the Palestinians. And in fact, it sees a mortal threat in any Palestinian. I mean, you know, uh, when you have hordes of people going marching the streets of Jerusalem, and calling this to the Arabs, and they do this, and also in uh, in Arab villages within 1948 Israel, uh, it shows you that uh, you're right. I mean, we are looking at a society that, is by uh, by any standard, and by the acknowledgement even uh, of very pro-Israel uh, uh, um, friends and so on, uh, they state that Israel has become more and more right-wing. It is becoming more and more fascistic. They espouse. Uh, these, you know, really supremacist ideas uh, and so on. And because they only probably see their survival only through that kind of supremacy and through the eradication of, uh, of all uh, Palestinians. But also, one must also admit that, you know, as it was in 1987, during the, this great intifada that went on for, you know, three or four years until it was uh, sort of put out, the flame was put out by some sort of a political process, the Oslo process. And as we have seen in Sheikh Jarrah and in Jerusalem, I mean, it seemed leaderless. It seemed that, you know, it was basically uh, like a field kind of leadership that, you know, congregate and went on to protect uh, Al-Aqsa, you know, as their their slogan, you know. And, and in fact, you know, until the, 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 um, the, the, the fighting erupted, you know, uh, with Hamas, uh, launching a rocket and then you know the Israelis just burning the, bombing the hell out of out of Gaza until then 
all the factions, including Hamas, were really left behind. So, is, you know, the Palestinians are always a step ahead of their leadership. It doesn't matter what this leadership is made of. To what you attribute this, this, this phenomenon? How could it go on? I mean, is this, does it have the seeds of its own uh, sort of, uh, you know, flickering away or does it have the seeds of going further? You see, the activism I'm, I'm seeing today in Al-Aqsa, in Sheikh Jarrah, uh, and in other places in Palestine, uh, luckily Al-Aqsa and Sheikh Jarrah and Jerusalem uh, doesn't have a, a political burden on it, neither from Fatah or Hamas or, or, or anyone. Maybe some of their cadre participates, but uh, there is no political burden on them. They faced the occupation directly. Um, what I see is a movement that has a grassroots uh, depth to it. And, and these movements in the 21st century, um, uh, they seem to have a spirit. They seem to have a soul. They seem to have a, a, a dynamism uh, among the, 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 the young, mostly dominated by young. I mean, whether you go to Occupy Wall Street or you go to the uh, uh, murder of uh, George Floyd and the movement that erupted after that, you get a sense of where we're going in history, in, in, in a historical sense, uh, related to globalization, related to uh, the way the world has operated, right. connected uh, access to social media, yeah. etc. It right. has created an ability to create a different kind of what we define as leaders or leadership and a, a, a movements that can sustain themselves through all this kind of action and where there is no single leader with an iron hand that takes all the people with him in the direction there is there is you, you may not see that but you will see more these young operatives uh, and and the, the the soul the the overall feeling for the for a movement that can be creative particularly when we're talking about civil rights movement, civil uh, non-violent uh, rocks and uh, uh, expressions of anger and putting people together, demonstrating, uh, uh, creating awareness. Uh, I mean, Sheikh Jarrah created awareness. It brought right. the Nakba to every house in the world. Right. Very simple. I mean, brought the Nakba. I mean, the, the Israelis who did Sheikh Jarrah uh, should be ashamed of themselves because what they did, they reminded the world of what has happened in 1948 and what has happened in the 1950s. All this dispossession has be entered every household in the world. So I see us going in that direction. Now, it's not doesn't mean that you cannot organize more at a higher level, coordinate, uh, etc. But uh, uh, that will happen. However, I see that this is the new bed. This is the new, uh, the new reality. This is the new movement, and it's not going to be unique to the Palestinians. It is worldwide. Let me ask you about the Arab dimension. You know, because we've seen this uh, this uh, eruption in uh, Jerusalem, of course, in Sheikh Jarrah, with good reason. We have had uh, episodes in the past. Uh, you know, sometime. A violent confrontation with the Israeli soldiers and, and armed settlers and so on. And sometimes uh, it's just, you know, some sort of a protest. Uh, we've seen this, you know, go day after day. They go to Al-Aqsa. They try to exercise for, you know, freedom of worship and, and all these things. And we see it resonate, uh, of course, in, in Palestine, uh, 1948, among Palestinians uh, in the 1948 area, in the Arab uh, towns and villages and so on. And we see it uh, in uh, uh, in Gaza, but we don't really see the level, let's say, of empathy or the, the, the level of uh, solidarity, you know, maybe with a few exceptions that we have seen, let's say, in the past. There was a great deal of, uh, uh, you know, empathy with the Palestinians when they were fighting the Israelis from Lebanon and so on, or even during the first intifada, something that we have seen lacking. Why is that? Well, keep in mind that, uh... The Arab world had major revolutions in 2010 to 11, and that was the Arab Spring. Right. But then there was a, a blunt counter-revolution mm -hmm. that uh, tried to and sought to 
uh, destroy the activists and the, uh, the results of these revolutions. But the story of the Arab world's change and transformation has just begun in 2010, 2011. It will continue to go deep into the grassroots of populations in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, even the United Arab Emirates, by the way, the Emiratis themselves, the people, right. and uh, definitely Kuwait, among others. You will be surprised that people are, are, are very sympathetic, are very connected, because that connection has to do with whom they are, the identity, Islam, right. uh, the uh, uh, being Arab, uh, justice and injustice, the Arab populations, uh, actually are thirsty for justice, each in their own country and state. And when they see injustice elsewhere, they definitely can feel the pain. So yes, the Arab world feels your pain. Look, when you open the space, like in a place like Kuwait, you feel how the population moves and goes into a sit-ins and uh, demonstrations, right. etc. You open it up in Morocco, look at the Moroccans. You see it, it represents, but in a, in a place where nothing is open, even an article, is not allowed. Even the simplest expression can throw you totally out of your job, out of livelihood, and etc. under a certain type of dictatorship that we have spread, uh, then you're not going to see. You would think that the representatives are the spokespersons of the state. The reality is that the population and many of those who are in jail are totally yeah. pro-Palestinian and yeah. they experience injustice and they support the Palestinians because they are living a, a situation of full injustice. So don't count the Arab world out. The Arab world, yes, will give its, its voice. And then take another ac account into the, the analysis is that we've had an Arab nationalist movement during the Nasser era and beyond. <coughs> and that Arab nationalist movement created an entire environment. But then it was uh, a hit, it was uh, destroyed, it was, uh, challenged uh, and uh, 67 played a role, the Arab-Israeli war. But then you get the Islamic movement. Right. And then as, as the situation gets more complicated in the Arab world, you have now a new generation. So I am witnessing a new generation. I see them in Kuwait. I see them when I travel. I see them when I talk with young Arabs everywhere. There is a sense of Arabism coming all over again. It's different than the old Arab nationalism. It, it, it also has roots in the sense of civilization and Islamic identity, but it's an Arab identity. Uh, and they, there is with it progressive ideas for change, for there is a sense that the Arabs today are, are totally divided and destroyed. There is a critique of the Sykes-Picot, uh, uh, what it imposed on the Arabs. Uh, the, so how do this play is not yet clear, but there is today a revolutionary Arab. He is pro-Palestinian, he is pro-change, he's very progressive, he wants to have a, a, a country that is independent from the West, independent in its own right, and he, he, so he or she, I mean, there is, many of those are the operatives of the Arab Spring of 211, 212, who became exiled in, in so many countries of the world who are speaking to each other and trying to write, to develop their ideas uh, into the next, uh, the next era. So the Arab world is going through a very deep process and we've witnessed some of the expressions, Algeria, Sudan for a while, uh, uh, we've seen it in Iraq, uh, we've see, you see it, I think it, it, will, it, will, it will come back. And mm -hmm. I think when you look at the Palestinians' ability to resist and stand and protect their dignity and identity, no matter what the circumstances, this is a, this is a model for the Arab world. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it has an impact. Uh, actually, when, I, when I, I did my research in Egypt on the 211 revolution in Egypt, and I met many of the young activists who were very central to the revolution, many of them were telling me, Gaza was an inspiration to us. And many of them told me, we went to Gaza and got that inspiration. They will go through the tunnels and come back. So that's an open book. That's an open, it's open. History has not ended. And, and uh, there is a lot that will be happening. And, and, and Zionism will, uh, uh, will be uh, 
facing uh, more challenges in that region. It has chosen enmity with the Arab populations. Mm -hmm. It has chosen enmity with the peoples of the Arab world. It has chosen friendship with some of the regimes that may not be popular. No. Well, you know, I want to press this point um, further, of course. Yeah, I mean, Zionism is a colonial movement, so it can only exist on, you know, the, 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 the sort of wreckage of uh, the people that it is uh, colonizing. I want to go back. You said something that, you know, struck me about the rise of uh, Islamism in a way, you know, uh, to fill the vacuum of, let's say, pan-Arabism that we have seen in the 50s it was dealt a, a major blow in 1967, but why, you know, why with the with the events that we saw, you know, in, in the Arab Spring, let's say between, uh, I guess, January 2011 and, and so on, we saw a great deal of, you know, sort of, or what appeared to be a rejection of pan Arabism. And people looked on their own, they looked to their own um, countries and so on, to their own states, so to speak. So if it's not, you know, Islamism, which is really very loose and covers, across, goes across borders and so on, then it is internal. Why is that? There is, had not been a reemergence of pan-Arabism that used to, you know, ignite the passions of, uh, of Arabs everywhere, let's say with the voice of Nasser or, or, or others. You see, we need to look at 211 in its own context. Right. So, no need to read more into it. Um, it is the first attempt by the Arab populations, because it wasn't only the Arab Spring revolutions, there were also many movements across the region affected by the wave, the big tsunami of the Arab revolution. But we need to look at it that this is the first time the Arab population said, I want something. I demand something. I want to uh, have my those I govern accountable to me. Uh, I exist. I say, I speak, I represent. It's the first time in 30, 40 years of repression. I mean, it doesn't mean there weren't some movements here and there, but it was, it was uh, uh, the, 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 politic, the, the regimes uh, killed politics in the Arab world mm -hmm. and destroyed it. And with the exception of a few places that still had some elections, Kuwait, one example, but generally the main centers of the populations, uh, uh, there was no, no air in the, in the uh, uh, no oxygen uh, to practice politics. So that's the beginning. And because of that, the experience is definitely shaky. And right. that's where the counter revolution comes. Right. Wait for the counter to the counter. And, and I think we are evolving. We are, we are evolving into, uh, uh, politics had been revived in the Arab world. Uh, 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 revived not because the regimes want it, because people talk about it and they understand that they have to be involved in their issues, in their rights, in their dignity in their economy. And, and so all these issues will, will come again. Uh, uh, but at the same time, there is a deeper problem. Uh, I, I, I mean, look at Egypt today. I mean, with, with what Ethiopia is doing with the water. I mean, you're, you're st strangling. The Nahda Dam. Yes, the Nahda Dam. Yeah. You're putting an entire civilization uh, uh, under so much stress and uh, a disaster. Uh, and Egypt will not be able to tolerate this for long. If the regime doesn't do much, I think there will be something happening in that part of the world. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, look at Syria, look at Iraq, look at other places. There is a fragmentation of the Arab world. It's like the Arab world has gone to the bottom of the bottom. But it's in that context that young people start to think, if we rise again, could we only rise as Syria and Iraq and Egypt, etc., or we need to think of bigger units? Arab populations are the only ones that live in smaller units in that part of the world. Therefore, their area, their neighborhood, the Arab world, has become a playground for bigger states, superpowers uh, uh, from the US all the way to Russia, and uh, definitely. Uh, uh, Turkey has a project, definitely Iran has a project. And, and so the Arab world is so fragmented that uh, uh, people will think how they can deal with that fragmentation in one way or another. I have no answer to that, but that's where I think and I feel and I hear discussions about Arab. I mean, I get Kuwaitis who are Arab nationalists today. I didn't have them in my class 15 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Now I have them in my class. I have 
uh, you, 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 go, you go to, to many places and, and you talk with the young, there is a sense of that the Arab is persecuted. Not only the Palestinian, Palestinian is the persecuted of the persecuted at right. the highest level, but right. the Arab is also persecuted at every level. And so this is the destiny of this part of the world will not be shaped by what we see today. It will change. And there will be many questions raised as it changes. Yeah, I also want to talk about this point. Uh, you know, the Arabs are fragmented. There's never been really a cohesive uh, movement, except episodically, as we've seen, we've seen we saw in the 50s, and be it ever so loosely, not not a fundamental kind of movement that can you know produce a thing. Is it because the legacy of colonialism, in your view, is it because Sykes Pico, or is it because uh, the Arabs, as many you know neoliberal Arabs and intellectuals and so on, claim that uh, we have the Arabs have you know sort of internal major internal uh, you know um, short uh, shortcomings and inability to you know sort of uh, you know parallel what what is happening in the world as Europe did as let's say even China and other places it's it's really it's it's hard to to tell the, the many uh, reasons that make the arab dilemma of today but right. we have to re remember that uh, uh, repression is one factor dictatorship is a factor in the way the Arab world uh, looks the way it is. Uh, and that uh, there is much more awareness today of the need to deal with that, that side. Uh, uh, it's also a question, it's an existential question for the region. Can you go on with, by being a, a, in the same context of what Sykes-Pico has produced? See, World War I was the beginning of the disaster. Right. Belfort Declaration, Sykes-Pico. Those who wrote Sykes-Pico are the ones who wrote, I mean, Sykes wrote Belfort Declaration. Right. And, and, and so he finished uh, Sykes-Pico and went to write the Belfort Declaration with, uh, with Wiseman and, uh, and others, uh, such as Herbert Samuel from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Britain, etc. So today, uh, people are dealing with these big questions. What happens? I mean, you produce a country and then, uh, it's fragmented in five minutes, and then it's destroyed, and then it's divided, and then it's uh, so. Is Arab is 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 the Arab identity a way that takes us beyond Shi'i, Sunni, Christian, Muslim, etc.? Is the Arab identity? It's still needed. It's still needed because the the the, the local states, whether it's Iraqi state or Syrian state or any other state has, has uh, created so many divisions and uh, uh, tried to uh, disconnect the connection with the Arab identity or with the Islamic identity. You cannot, that region has to build its identity probably now from scratch. Right. So, uh, okay, I mean, uh, we grew up, my generation, uh, yeah. and I'm talking about myself as a Palestinian, as an Arab, you know, and I traveled the Arab world and lived in many Arab countries and so on. My generation was pan-Arabist, and pan-Arabism meant, you know, two things. You know, it meant that Palestine is the central cause. Everybody is committed to the liberation of Palestine. And the other cause, somehow, a sort of vague, if uh, not vague, you know, not well-defined, let's put it, one not well-defined perception of socialism and, you know, a republic that, uh, you know, is a sort of, uh, passionate about its own sovereignty and its own uh, dignity, but now, is is the Palestinian could the Palestinian cause be central again to the Arabs? You know, is there you know is there kind of a conflict between let's say the centrality of the Palestinian cause on the one hand uh, and the pursuit of freedoms and uh, liberalism and so on, uh, as as many claim? Is there is there a, you know are they um, can they be reconciled with one another or are they sort of one can only exist at the expense of the other. No, I mean, the Palestinian cause is still the central cause, but it's not anymore in mm -hmm. the way in the way it expressed itself in the past, where regimes said this is our central uh, cause. Regimes are in trouble, have sanctions on them, are facing uh, so many international laws that they don't know how to deal with. Uh, they are cornered, they are uh, marginalized. The populations are the ones that have a different imagination, a different feel, and to them, Palestine is a central cause 
but injustice in their countries is also a central cause and right. building a, a state that is accountable and a state that is independent and a state that cares about its people and leaders that change uh, uh, routinely through elections and etc is a central issue today in the arab world and this all uh, is, is 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 coming around a sense of an identity issue arab or islam or a sense of injustice the sense of injustice the reality of justice in palestine these things are very interconnected and they will produce some sort of a project. Today, what the Arab world is lacking, there is no Arab project. Right. There's an Iranian project, there's a Turkish project, there's an Israeli project. And we know what the Israeli project is in the Palestinian lands, but also the Israeli project is also aiming at the Arab world. Right. It yeah, aims we'll at fragmentation, it aims at its weakness, it, it, it uh, builds contacts with parties that it can have a better impact on them, that they cannot say much of a no, uh, given their weakness uh, in front of Iran and, and Turkey and other countries. So the question of how can the Arab world rebuild again, but does it rebuild with the same way it did in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s to be destroyed later? Right. There are serious questions today being asked. So I want to ask you if, you know, if, if Palestine or the Palestinian cause can still, you know, uh, engender passions in, in the Arab world. What we have seen in the last couple of weeks, you know, yeah. and even since the beginning of Ramadan when the whole uh, thing began at Sheikh mm -hmm. Rah and al Aqsa, we have seen, you know, some, you know, like uh, maybe groups of people going out uh, on the streets and, you know, expressing solidarity, but we have not seen it all across the world. We've seen it, you know, in the last few days, we've seen it uh, in Morocco, for instance. You know, uh, where in fact, you know, the, the 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 country has normalized with Israel just you know a couple of months ago, and so on. And we've seen it maybe in, in Kuwait uh, to a certain extent. We've seen it in Jordan, but really nowhere else, so to speak. Uh, and I, I must admit, in Iraq as well. So why, despite you know what we've seen, despite the images that we see uh, every day, it has not ignited uh, the kind of you know uh, passion, passionate response or expression of solidarity. Why is that? Again, we go back to repression. Yeah. Today, who's in jail in the Arab world? Yeah. You look at Egypt and look at elsewhere. Who's yeah. in jail? Yeah. Some of the best elites, some yeah. of the best writers, some of the most independent minds. Mm -hmm. Who's in exile? Some of the best, most of the best writers and thinkers and independent minds. And who can stay? those who are not able to say anything, though they may think otherwise, because they will be pulled to jail. And jail conditions are not, are not easy at all mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the Arab world. Uh, that came with, with the price after the Arab revolutions mm -hmm. uh, imposed on the populations of the region. Uh, mm -hmm. However, this will not be sustained. This cannot mm -hmm. stay. It will not stay. I think many of the regimes, mm -hmm. I don't say, oh, many, and are, are losing, losing in influence, losing in credibility, losing in convincing uh, all these people in jail uh, and, and a lot of torture. There are also uh, people who disappear. Uh, we're going through the uh, old Argentinian phase of the 1970s, etc. Chile, Argentina, etc. It's a phase, but that phase cannot be sustained because the, the, the Arab populations uh, are becoming poorer, are becoming uh, uh, and more. Despite, despite all the wealth. You know, nothing is improved. Yeah. The regimes are not delivering. Right. So, so it's losing. It's losing credibility, popularity, etc. with time. You look today and you compare with five years ago, uh, things are changing. Five years later, much more. So they are in solidarity with the Palestinians, but at the same time, they are also in a jail, in a bigger right. one. And... Uh, 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 in the past, the Arab regimes used to allow that solidarity to come out, to come up, to express itself, because it released pressure. Mm -hmm. Today, the Arab regimes realize that even that model is problematic. Mm -hmm. It comes back to it, and it's afraid. I mean, I think many of the Arab regimes are, 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 are shocked that this has happened, that few young people in Jerusalem and in Sheikh Jarrah these activists were created an entire picture, an entire phenomena, brought back the Palestinian story, 
to every household in the Arab world, but to many households worldwide. Uh, it's, it's, it's in that context that we need to see it. I, I want to switch gears. I mean, this we could talk yeah. about this for, forever, and I have so many questions uh, from uh, you know uh, our viewers and, and so on. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about this very last point. I mean, the Palestinians or the Jerusalemites were able to create something that really brought the Palestinians yeah. together. I mean, for a very long time, you know, yeah. Gaza was fighting it wars alone, so to speak. You know, I don't want to use that, but you know, Israel would come and bomb Gaza. Would, uh, the West Bank would not move, where Jerusalem would not move, and so on, you know. But this time, it's different. Is, is that correct? Yes, today, uh, you see, you, you always look in, in big social movements at the moment. Yeah. There is an element of unity. Nice at all. And huh. so the Boazizes of yeah. the Palestinian uh, new uh, expression, uh, right. rebellion, intifada, mm -hmm. uh, etc., uh, came from Sheikh Jarrah and the Aqsa Mosque. And, uh, and it ignited, but the room was full of gas. Yeah. It needed someone to ignite it. Those youngsters felt it, realized it, did a campaign, and it happened. But it's, the room is full of gas. Yeah. Palestinians in 1948 Palestine are not happy regarding their condition. And they've been discriminated against, and the discrimination is increasing. Uh, uh, same with the West Bank, uh, given all the uh, the pressure. I mean, maybe Ramallah has some affluence. You go to the areas outside Ramallah, uh, a lot of unemployment, a lot of poverty, difficulties, and it is the occupation because the occupation has cut down the West Bank's economy, isolated uh, its areas. People cannot trade at ease. You cannot trade with Jerusalem. They cannot move from one place to the other. And at the same time, the settlements are eating up, are destroying the rest of the West Bank, and they are putting settlers there that use Palestinian water and Palestinian resources. Right. And they, they destroyed the Palestinian state's ideal. Right. The Zionist movement and the Israeli government under Netanyahu. Now, you, 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 you go to Gaza, encircled under siege, from sea, from air, from ground. Uh, the, one of the biggest and strongest armies in the world is now uh, putting uh, putting all its abilities uh, against a small organization, relatively speaking, a small area, 350 square kilometers, populated with more than two and a half million people, 2.3 million people. How can that happen? So the, the room was full of gas and the Palestinians realized that nobody will help them until they help themselves. And nobody will sympathize with them until they present their story again and that they need to keep presenting their story every day and every month as much as they can at every level and not to be contained by any political authority or, or otherwise. And I think those young activists discovered the moment, discovered what is happening and ignited it. And that is the scene today. And the question after that scene will be how to sustain, how to sustain, not necessarily on the military level through civil unrest, through civil disobedience by expressing the story and the need to express all your the, the, the realities of injustice by holding to your land, by holding to your home, by, by challenging the settlers, etc. Yes, there will be casualties, but that is a very important uh, uh, movement to sustain, given today that I feel for the first time in a long time, and maybe for the first time ever, that the world is listening. Yeah. And I see some, yeah. some people who have taken positions, I didn't expect them singers, basketball players uh, 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 across the world and across the USA. So there is, even in the Democratic Party, even among many uh, Jewish younger youngsters and, and others who are active, there is a change of, of heart that, fine, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, but what does this have to do with murdering children, with putting cities under siege, destroying people, uh, destroying houses, 50,000, 60,000 houses were destroyed in the West Bank over a period of, of a couple of decades. The land has been taken, and there is more land to be taken. Every day there is a new settlement project by groups that are very extremist and very ISIS-like. Right. ISIS-like in their ideology. Yeah, that's very true. And, and today at least there is Fanatic. a realization, the world, at least the peoples of the world, the peoples of the world, the, the structures, the peoples of the world are paying attention. Mm -hmm. That should continue.
Yeah. So you mentioned uh, something about the Democratic Party here in the United States, and I want to ask you, as a political scientist uh, and, and a, you know, a long time observer of the United States and what it does and its hegemony all, all, all over the world and its role in the world, so to speak, what should the Palestinians expect from the Biden administration? I mean, we've seen this administration push up the urgency of the fighting that is going on. I mean, they come up with statement, you know, that Israel has a right to defend itself, uh, this, which is really a euphemism uh, for Israel to keep going, to keep killing Palestinians, to keep destroying and so on, using American weapons and so on. So what should the Palestinians today, you know, uh, maybe uh, those who are involved in fighting like Hamas uh, in Gaza or uh, the Palestinian Authority, I mean, in terms of, let's say, the immediate future, what should they or could they expect from the Biden administration? Well, at, at least I will say they will not expect from the Biden administration what Trump was doing. Right. Trump was a very extreme. I mean, he had a settler mentality and uh, his his uh, his son-in-law is a settler. I mean, you know, his, they, they so, aided the Beit Hill, you know. So anyway. So yeah. Trump was an extreme case. Uh, Biden uh, is definitely uh, limited to many conditions. Uh, so I expect certain things to happen. Right. Maybe some pressure for a ceasefire, maybe, but I don't expect a major breakthrough. I don't <laughs> expect a major proposals or ideas. <laughs> Biden, President Biden did put the Palestinian issue on the slow burner and was focused on China and other regions in the world. They didn't want to get involved in the Palestinian story. But the Palestinian story involved the entire world with it. And so it, it, there should be some steps. However, I'm not expecting much, but at least I'm expecting that people are changing and that change should continue. And that change could have an impact on politicians. There yeah. are members of Congress today who talk about what is happening in Palestine? Could they increase in numbers? There are members of uh, of uh, different civil society in America who are in full solidarity with the Palestinians. I think what has started now, what has happened now, should continue, and, yeah. and that will produce certain results at some point. Uh, and one should ally with all of those who are committed. Uh, mm -hmm. And I see it even when they go to sit-ins and demonstrations in the US, I see Black Lives Matter are right. there, are central uh, among other groups. So there is a change. <coughs> okay, let me go to some of uh, uh, the questions that uh, we received. Uh, so uh, we have one that says it is clear that Israel has zero desire to respect the right of return. Uh, by the way, like uh, Peter Beinart, who is a uh, you know, a great American intellectual and so on, uh, just wrote an essay a couple of days ago, said that the only way to prevent war is really for the Palestinians uh, to exercise the right of return. So, how, you know, what do you think it will take for Israel to finally, you know, acquiesce to the Palestinian right of return? I read that piece. That was an excellent piece. Right, yeah. And and, and it, it gives hope. Yeah. Uh, because if if the right of return is not dealt with properly and justly, uh, the Nakba is going to keep surfacing all over again. Yeah. And as he says in the article, what makes uh, a group of Jews uh, who didn't have any relation with Palestine for 2,000 years mm -hmm. to come up again with some interpretation mm -hmm mostly a Christian evangelical uh, interpretation to go to Palestine. What will make Palestinians who are living the Nakba every day, every moment, who were kicked out of their houses and homes just 73 years ago, and the, 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 the evacuation from their land continued as, as Israel pursued uh, uh, creating out of them refugees. 67, there were like 300,000 of them. And then they, they keep pressuring them to leave putting all the difficulties. So the Nakba is a present reality. It's not history. It's not like 
Something has happened 50 years or 80 years or 100 or 1,000 years, and, and it's just a history. It is a present reality, and therefore the right of return that is a product of the Nakba mm. will not go away. Whether, whether uh, a Palestinian leader say, I'm forgetting about it or not, it has nothing to do. It is a reality of, of feelings and rights, and it is guaranteed by international law at every level. Uh, so, so you, it, it has to be addressed. It cannot be left. Uh, and uh, what make would make Israel agree to that? Uh, that's where. See, today Israel has created in Palestine an apartheid situation, mm -hmm. and this apartheid situation is what we describe today. You know, blockades. Uh, uh, you don't have an airport, you can't leave, you can't come, everything is controlled. <clears throat> Israel has created an apartheid discrimination. I mean, roads for Israelis, roads for Palestinians. Right. Uh, uh, an, an apartheid where Palestinians cannot go pray in Aqsa, meaning those in the West Bank. Right. Apartheid, you go to, to, to Hebron, uh, the same street is divided. The bigger one for Israeli settlers, the smaller one for the population of Hebron who lives there in their houses, uh, settlements, it's an apartheid. And therefore the struggle against apartheid yeah. is what will produce that change. It's the awareness among Jews in the world, but mm. also public opinion in the world, but mm. also all people who understand justice and support justice and stand for justice. The pressure, sanctions on Israel, that's mm. where the, the, the boycott comes. And, and, and so we, it's a process now. Now the situation in Palestine has been elevated to a certain level, but it's the continuity of the struggle against apartheid. Mm -hmm. It's the only way to protect yourself, to defend yourself, to defend your land, to exist, to get your rights, to face up to racism, to destroy walls, to, to, to live in dignity. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that happened in South Africa. Yeah. And I see it's, there is the same form in different ways is happening in Palestine, but it's a long struggle. It's not gonna end in one year or two years or five years. And at, at the climax of that struggle, uh, you will have changes in the Israeli mindset. You will have changes in the uh, uh, Jewish mindset as well, as they realize more and more that there is no way out of this. There is no way you can get rid of the Palestinian people. And there is no way you can sustain that apartheid. And once that realization is there, then everything is possible. So it's, the problem is with Zionism at its core and its core beliefs and the way it handles the whole story around it, the land, the people of Palestine, uh, the, the, the whole issue of the right of return for Jews, but not for Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Israel settled more than a million Russian Jews just between the 90s. Right. Yeah. Why not settle Palestinians? Right. You're gonna fight? People fight only when there is injustice. Look at America. It has Palestinians, it has Arab, millions of Arabs. It has millions of Latinos. It has millions. Why white supremacies will not work? Because it is trying to destroy a model that works for the world. Regardless what we think of how deep is American democracy or not. We look at the experiment, we see that there are all kinds of people, they're living in peace. They will definitely go to war. If there is injustice and you're persecuting a particular group of people, etc., and you're not allowing them to express themselves. So why the fear of people who belong to the land, who belong to the place? So yes, even Alain Pepe have argued for the right of return, mm -hmm. who is an Israeli uh, mm -hmm. scholar of, of a first class scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I, I would argue in that context, but it's going to take a long struggle to get there. It's not like tomorrow or after tomorrow. Right, uh, indeed. I mean, the Israelis uh, will never reconcile themselves to right return. The, the, the current Israeli leadership and so on, or the, the ruling uh, class. And, and, that's, and that's why they, they don't even recognize the existence of the Palestinians in, in the West Bank and in Jerusalem and so on. And they go over to you know, places that are far away, uh, hence the normalization. And I have a question for you from our chairman, uh, Dr. Subhi to comment on the normalization. I'm sure it is transactional in many ways, not really genuine in any way, but I'd like you to, to see how this normalization 
uh, in terms of what is happening now in Gaza and Jerusalem, what is the future of this normalization? I mean, it's, uh, it's a surprise for the normalization uh, process because the normalization uh, came based on a paradigm that, uh, and it, it looks that, uh, uh, I mean, several states have been pulled into that direction that yes, there can be peace with the Arabs without addressing the grievances and the injustices that the Palestinians are suffering from, or even without Israeli withdrawal from any land are by continuing to control all of Palestine. So that normalization started on the wrong foot. And today, the uh, uprising we see in Palestine is telling us there is no peace actual between the Arab world and Israel without mm -hmm. dealing with the Palestinian cause and the injustices the Palestinians are suffering from. But also with Gaza entering the war, it is saying there is no solution to the Palestine question, even whatever you do without also involving Gaza, because there is all these attempts by the Israelis to divide the Palestinians, right. Palestinian Authority, isolate. ABC, uh, uh, East Jerusalem uh, alone, uh, Aqsa and Sheikh Jarrah, uh, Palestinians of 1948 who live uh, behind what is called the Green Line, uh, another situation, and Gaza, another situation. Suddenly, all these situations came together to express one phenomena and one expression of, of facing up to their rights. I have a question on uh, how do you see, or do you believe that uh, you know, the current uh, uprising in Palestine will continue to gain momentum? Will continue to gain momentum? Or once there is, you know, I guess, a quiet or a ceasefire or something like this, it will uh, be, uh, you know, so it will recede. How do you see it? See, as long as the Israelis continue with apartheid, right. the Palestinians will continue to resist it. Right. However, much of this resistance in the last months and in the last years was not seen by the world. Today, it is seen by the world because of a larger phenomenon. And right. I think that after a ceasefire, uh, Palestinians will continue, but it may take different forms, different shapes, uh, different methods of expression, uh, but they gonna come and take and grab the houses in Sheikh Jarrah, you're gonna see confrontation. You're gonna go into Aqsa because the secular group believes that they have to destroy Al-Aqsa or share it to the Palestinians, it will ignite. See, the Israelis in the way they behave, in the way they operate, in the way Zionism, the ideological uh, 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 beliefs are translated on the ground to grabbing land, to building settlement, to taking houses, all of this, the situation will continue to ignite. Now, maybe Palestinians will take a break, maybe there will be a time where things kind of calm down, but then it will ignite again. Today, it has entered a different level. It's a different level that is more challenging to the apartheid system at the hands of a younger generation. So uh, let me take you back to the current uh, situation, the current uprising. I mean, we don't want to call it an intifada. It was basically a movement to protect uh, Al-Aqsa, to protect the integrity of uh, Arab East Jerusalem, Sheikh Jarrah, and all these things. But I want to take you back to the issue, a nagging issue of the leadership, you know, because on the one hand, I mean, let's face it, we have a leadership of Palestinian Authority that is uh, not only, you know, been there for a very long time, you know, it's aging, uh, it's an understatement, it's aging, you know, a, a, in many ways. And, but it's also disconnected, disconnected from what we see this youth. I'm, you know, I, I'm just pondering you know, with you, here. I'm exploring with you. Is it possible that we see, you know, as we have seen in the 50s, you know, the, the rise of the, uh, the Palestinian factions and, and so on with their ideologies? Can we see the same thing that is really independent from, let's say, the political environment uh, around? Can we see a rise in youth, uh, sort of more organized uh, effort that can probably not only be in, in Jerusalem and in the West Bank and so on, but also in Gaza, where there is, you know, a very strong political grip by Hamas? I would see that, yes. I would see changes happening. Uh, it's hard to predict timing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, there has been, there is a lot of marginalization to the existing leadership. That marginalization started by the Israelis. They weakened the Palestinian authority themselves by grabbing more land and putting more settlements and, and, and putting economic pressures on it and all the security 
uh, dealings that uh, has been taking place. So in a way, uh, there is a vacuum in that context, uh, and that vacuum will be will be filled at some point. Uh, if you recall, just recently there was the whole discussion about the elections and uh, Barghouti in jail. Uh, Marwan uh, was uh, potential, uh, so you may have ended up with a president of Palestine who is in jail. Uh, 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 it's, it's, I think we, we will we'll also see surprises. We will see things are changed. The change has happened, but how will it express itself is a matter to be seen, uh, given that the Palestinians are also in a dilemma in the West Bank. On the one hand, uh, they, they don't want to get into a big conflict with the Palestinian Authority where the Israelis will exploit. On the other hand, they are focused on the Israelis. So as the confrontations continue with the Israelis, uh, uh, these changes will continue at the grassroots. The people are out in the streets. The people are expressing themselves. There is a movement going on. There is more, uh, there is space taking place. Uh, so I, I find it uh, natural that it will have an impact on the leadership and as well will produce new leaders at different uh, levels. So we're already seeing the young ones. Uh, coming to uh, to life yeah why i mean why this perceived it, it may not be the case but there is a perceived disengagement uh, by the leadership from this whole thing that goes around i mean in gaza we see uh, a tremendous fight between uh, hamas uh, and uh, other resistance movement uh, uh, in the perceived gaza strip and the israeli occupation we see people on the street facing up to the israeli occupation and so on uh, we see that you know some of the security elements in the Palestinian Authority itself being targeted, but there is a perceived disengagement. You know, there is a disconnect between the leadership in Ramallah and and the street, so to speak. Why is that? Is that is that real? Is that uh, you know just uh, or you, exaggerated? You remember we we spoke that we are all products of our generation, right? right yeah, and. Uh, that generation that created the Palestinian Authority, I mean, uh, ended up creating what is closer to an Arab regime, but it also had a colonial reality surrounding mm -hmm. it, uh, Israel, its pressure, its economic pressures, its system, its, its uh, ability to take more lands, to build more settlements, uh, to isolate it. None of the leaders can even move from area to area without security a check up with, without a security check up with the Israelis. The Israelis have to allow the movement even in the West Bank. Uh, uh, so uh, that generation is a product of that era. But there is a new era coming. It will produce a different style and a different uh, level of leadership. Uh, how it will express itself, how it will happen. Uh, will the leadership come and say, we have done what we can, we move on. Will they go back to some form of elections or will they uh, submit to the will of the power of the people in the region in, in, in different regions in Palestine, in different areas in Palestine, is to be seen. So uh, let me ask you uh, something that just uh, occurred to me. I mean, all this mass movement that we have seen, you know, uh, that in includes Palestinians in Jerusalem, the West Bank, uh, 1948, Gaza and all these things, it almost, you know, has relegated the uh, Trump plan, you know, the so-called uh, uh, deal of the century, if you remember, it seemed like ages ago. But on the ground, it is being implemented. Uh, would you, uh, in your opinion, what is the fate of this plan now as a result of this, uh, you know, of this passionate and strong popular movement in, in occupied Palestine? I think Trump, uh did what he wanted to do. He wanted normalization with several Arab countries, but he failed to push it more to others. There were others under a lot of pressure. Mm. It's well known. I mean, some several Arab Gulf countries were under more severe pressure to normalize, but they were able to maneuver themselves out of it. Uh, so it ended up with some states, not all the states. And uh, uh, the Israelis, uh, uh, the, I mean, the embassy has been already moved right. to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, so some of it has happened. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, uh, so-called uh, deal of the century, uh, 
today proves in the eyes of the world that uh, it doesn't solve anything. Mm -hmm. And on the contrary, some of the states that they normalized with could end up denormalizing in a different stage, in a different era. So it didn't solve anything. It only complicated things and made the US look negatively, look bad in, in the eyes of millions, hundreds of millions of Arabs, and definitely in the eyes of the Palestinians. So do you, you believe that you know, one of the things that this administration, the Biden administration can do is basically disavow the deal of the century to move forward, to gain some credibility? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I see we are in a process. There is a rebellion. There is a situation. Uh, they may have to uh, move away of some of it. Uh, yeah. They're not going, in my opinion, to move away from the embassy in right. Jerusalem right. or yeah. the normalization with the UAE, yeah. Bahrain, etc. Um, they will continue that. Uh, yeah. uh, so, and to what extent do they want to be involved? And to what extent is there pressure on them to be involved? And to what extent is there a counter pressure by the Israelis as well? Uh, so uh, there, is a, there is also issues in the US regarding policy towards Palestine and the Arab world. Mm -hmm. That's an issue has been always there, right? I mean, it's not new, but uh, so even with good intentions, I realize there is some good intentions in the administration. Uh, there are so many uh, impediments Mm -hmm. uh, in Congress and elsewhere, uh, while you have an administration focused still on Corona, focused on the economy, focused on China, focused, etc. So I'm not sure how far will they go. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, let's look at this administration, what it has uh, done so far with the Palestinian Israeli issue. I mean, it's, uh, I, I think you, you mentioned that uh, Biden came into office saying that this is not a priority for me. The Palestinian Israeli uh, is not a priority. I want to focus on, like you mentioned, China, maybe the Iran deal, maybe you know, bringing the troops from Afghanistan and so on. But somehow the Palestinian issue fa always finds a way to reimpose itself on the stage um, uh, of the world. But you know, we have not seen this administration really take measures to say that is wrong. That is not something that we will uh, in any way you know, continue to espouse or defend or anything that, you know, they talk, they pay lip service to the two-state solution, you know, uh, but nothing really has materialized. I mean, uh, we look at the UN, Dr. Shafiq, what happened in the last week? The United States, you know, obstructed four efforts to have something done at the Security Council. They just scuttled it. You know, every time there's an effort by the other 14 members, the U.S. says, no, this is going to complicate our diplomatic effort that is ongoing. And they claim to be to have a diplomatic uh, effort. Uh, today, the White House issued a, a statement. I saw that the spokesperson from the White House say uh, that, uh, you know, Biden, the president, uh, spoke with the Israeli prime minister uh, and told him you should de-escalate in preparation for a ceasefire. But I'm not really too sure. How do you see this week? you know, ending. Are we going to have uh, some sort of a ceasefire? Is this administration going to, at one time, to say, uh, enough, stop, you know? I mean, after all, uh, when Biden was vice president in 2014, we saw that uh, Israel's war on Gaza continued for 51 days, 2,200 people, you know, a lot of them, women and children, half of them, women and, uh, and children were killed. So. What do you expect uh, to see in the next few days as far as the U.S. role and the conflict? I, I mean, I think there is more pressure uh, and the pressure is mounting on Israel uh, as it continues. Uh, uh, and maybe the American administration will push for a ceasefire. Now, because that's a burning issue and it's, it's uh, in the face, it's daily. Uh, but how far will it push beyond that is, is not clear. It, it, will, it will try to deal with the escalation to de-escalate, but maybe stop there. Yeah. Stop there. And this is where I see that America will change one day, but that has to take place at the grassroots level. That has to reflect itself over time in Congress and elsewhere. And as the 
people, I mean, look, look at someone like Bernie Sanders and what he stands for, but there is a grassroots movement behind that thinking. So we need to uh, be objective by, by seeing that the change is not going to happen soon or fast, but I do know that this administration uh, isn't happy with, with the uh, continuity of uh, a warlike situation and, and the Gaza uh, attacks and many children are dying, many families, huge buildings are put to the ground. Uh, it's in the face and uh, definitely the pressures come from different places, from different corners of the world, as much as from different corners of the US population. Mm -hmm. I'm not very optimistic as far as the administration is concerned. I mean, I've seen them one after another. I observed uh, uh, this administration and past administration keeping parroting out the same slogan, you know, two-state solution, but Israel has a right to defend itself, you know, which is, you know, like a blank check to go ahead and do what, what it wants. We have not seen uh, any, you know, diplomatic effort uh, uh, on, uh, on the ground and so on. So I don't know. I am not, I don't have much faith uh, in, in at least, you know, in the immediate future for this administration taking fundamental steps to really end the suffering of the Palestinians. But let me ask you, as someone who also knows the world, the same thing is also true in Europe. Why is that? Why is there no, you know, at the personal level, now at, at the, uh, I'm sorry, at the, um, uh, the governmental level, there is not much or a great deal of sympathy with the Palestinians or solidarity or strong stance against Israel, although we see it, um, you know, by the people of, of this country. Why is that? Why is uh, the, the Palestinian issue that is so stark as we see it today is failing to generate the kind of uh, empathy by the government, the European government, uh, that, you know, that can reflect their people's uh, sentiment? You see, this is why uh, my focus in the previous question was a ceasefire is possible. Mm -hmm. And I see the American administration trying to get us in that direction, but not beyond that, not more. So maybe that's the only thing that will happen. Uh, however, uh, uh, I'm not sure how long would that take as well, whether it's another two, three days or another 10 days. Uh, however, for a change in governments in the world, uh, the movement in Palestine that has taken shape in the last few weeks has to continue. Yeah. The struggle against this kind of apartheid right. has to continue. And it's slow, building step by step, putting more pressure and more pressure, boycott, etc. And over time, I mean, look at South Africa. It took decades. It took decades yeah. under, under Mandela's leadership. And it, 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 the, the regime finally came to its senses once it realized it cannot get away with murder, it cannot get away with the apartheid, it cannot get away with discrimination, with racism. It, it, there was so much, so much uh, sanctions. And America was the last, the last, because it was very on good terms with South Africa. Israel was in definitely good terms with South Africa. Oh, no. so it was the last, the US, to have a, a congressional act uh, just a few years before apartheid ended. So. We need to look at that, that, you see, the solution is not in diplomacy. The, 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 the solution is not in, it's in the struggle. It's in the grassroots struggle. It's in the uh, civil disobedience. It's in the uh, uh, non-military side of it. Though Gaza has a military side and they have the right to do that, but that's not going to be the thing you're going to see all the time. There are these, these situations that happen between Gaza and, and the surrounding, but it's not all the time. Uh, even in Gaza, there was a, uh, an attempt to go to the border and uh, fly balloons and, and uh, do popular movement. So popular grassroots movement that also opens up to the world and to the social media, that brings the story to every house, that continues, that makes people see exactly, because Israel has always, worked hard on hiding its crimes, worked hard on doing the worst, but without anybody seeing, doing everything at night, doing everything when the world is asleep. Now is the time where accountability is there, where 
they have to, everything has to be exposed and magnified and clearly put in the face of the world. I think that is the, the, the side that will create the kind of movement that can bring this apartheid into a state of collapse and bring many Israelis to realize as well what is happening, independent, how, I mean, regardless how far do they know or not, and many Israeli intellectuals to feed the pressure as well, that they have to take a stand or else this boycott, this situation will, will continue. It will just build up, build up day after day. I think we entered an era like this and it's very important to keep that as long as the apartheid continues and there is no nothing in the in the in the environment that's telling us that this apartheid is going to leave tomorrow that the israeli army is withdrawing that the settlements are uh, leaving that uh, aqsa is left alone that sheikh jarrah is left alone no they're going to continue on sheikh jarrah they're going to continue but let the world know and and let everybody be aware of what is happening i think that will create a different feel for the entire nations of the of the globe on this profound note, uh, Dr. Shafiq, uh, we end our conversation today. It is really uh, very, very profound what you just said, that the struggle must uh, must continue. It's not diplomacy, but what happens on the ground. And that is 100% true. The the the, uh, the Palestinian struggle in Jerusalem and Sheikh Jarrah uh, was basically reflected uh, and expressed in solidarity with the Palestinians. And that's what matters. Uh, thank you very much. This has been truly enlightening. We can go on and discuss many things. There are so many aspects to this discussion. Uh, so we thank you. I thank you. And we hope to see you soon. Thank you, sir. I, I, I look forward. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. I turn you over to Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rabra. We appreciate you coming, uh, coming here to speak. And that was an excellent presentation. And thank you so much. It's more relevant than ever today. Uh, so thank you for taking the time, and uh, we hope to have you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for your effort. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye. To you Bye -bye. and to your audience. Thank you so much.